Calgary Pride proudly serves Treaty 7 on the traditional territory of the Nitsitapi Confederacy, Ayajenakola, and Esutina. This land is also home to a Métis nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. This place, where the Elbow River meets the bow, is known by many names to many people, including Mohinsis, Winchespa, Kurtziso, Otoskune, and Calgary. We thank the indigenous communities of Turtle Island for both the historic and ongoing stewardship and protection of the land we collectively inhabit today. Many nations and people, indigenous and non, are fortunate to call Mokinsis and Treaty 7 territory our home. Acknowledging this land is indigenous protocol, which we honor as a step towards reconciliation and fulfilling our responsibilities as treaty people. Working alongside all nations, indigenous and non, we strive to create safe spaces where everyone can live openly and authentically. Hi, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of this broadcast brought to you by CJSW. I'm your host for this episode, Anna. My pronouns are she, her, and I handle marketing and fund development for Calgary Pride this festival season. Calgary Pride's focus this year is creating space and visibility for the folks who live in our city and have intersecting identities within the 2SLGBTQ plus community. Join us each episode where we'll feature change makers of the past, present, and the future sharing their journeys of pride. Today we are honored to have a special guest who not only creates stories but lives a life focused on honoring the intersections of queer and rural experiences and illustrates the beautiful complexities of exploring one's own queer identity. Kat Simmers is a celebrated graphic novelist, illustrator, writer, and muralist based in Calgary, Alberta. Kat's mural work can be found throughout Treaty 7 in support of local businesses and has several murals in association with the Beltline Urban Mural Project, a, cel a celebrated Calgary-based art festival. Kat's graphic novel series, made in partnership with co-author Ryan Danny Owen, Pass Me By, consists of Volume 1, Goin' Fishin', and the, new the newly released Volume 2, Electric Vice, and they can be found in libraries or wherever books are sold. Kat, welcome to the Pridecast, and thank you for being here with me today. Hi, hello. Thank you for having me. So, how are you? Have you survived the heat so far? I'm good. I'm well. I am uh, finally feel like I'm coming out of a forest of work that's uh, been surrounding me for a while. I can see the, I can see the light clearing. I'm like uh, trying to uh, schedule some time for myself in July and August uh, to relax and work on book three. Um, before starting another big project uh, yeah. up in Red Deer. Oh, Red Deer. <laughs> if anybody who is listening is familiar with the smaller towns throughout the province of Alberta, yeah, Red Deer is uh, dead center. A mid, mid city range, I'd say, like not Edmonton, not Calgary, but. I think it's the third largest city in, uh, in Alberta. I actually went there for my first two years of art college. Um, I went to RDC, which is now Red Deer Polytechnic. Yeah. Um, and that's actually who I'm talking to are working with on a new project for an event center that they have downtown. Oh, that's actually really exciting. Not that it actually, it is very exciting. But Thank that's, you. Uh, <laughs> just in terms of like loop around where, just in terms of like your origins, where you started, you're looping back around and collaborating with the same people. That's really exciting stuff. Yeah, it's really cool. Um, there's kind of like a little history of homecoming starting to show up in my art practice where last summer in 2021, my brother Derek and I went back to bash off for three different projects. Um, we worked on a mural restoration, a couple of new works, and some signage. And yeah, it's really great because like I've learned so much through like all the art school that I've attended, and a lot more after that from just like practical experience being a professional artist. So yeah. there's a lot that I can do that a lot that other people. Uh, it's it's a rare skill to to be able to pull off these projects like I have, and I'd love that I can like come back to a town of 830 people like Bashaw and do this gorgeous mural work. Um, and that's, that's exciting to go back to Red Deer Polytechnic and uh, sort of return some of the gifts that I was given through that program. Yeah, absolutely. And then, um, yeah, is that sort of a value that you incorporate into your work and into your storytelling and your murals even? Is just like kind of, um, I don't know, circling back to reflecting back on your life and um, I'm lacking the words at the moment, but... There's definitely like uh, 
I don't know if reciprocity is the right word, but there's That's like... That's a perfect word to describe what I'm yeah, trying to sure. find. Yeah, sure. I'm a writer. I can use fancy words. <laughs> I'm a writer. Um, I know what's up. So, yeah, like so much of um, what I'm doing with uh, murals that I work on or graphic novels, even posters, I'm trying to incorporate a lot of, you know, my own experience and the places that I've come from and the people that have helped me get where I am, people that I've learned from. Um, that's very much embedded in, in all of the characters that I write and pass mm. me by. That's even like whenever I'm like painting a mural, like if that's got a figurative bent or even is dealing with still life or something, you know, I'm trying to think of uh, really deeply about my experience and how that also includes other people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in how like a character in isolation in a story is... Actually, Shy is Sung Project just did a really good job of showing that. So oh, cool. I was going to say it's hard to do, and yeah, it yeah. is. That's why that book is so good. But um, I'm really interested in interactions of people. I'm really inter interested in how we build our worlds together through the conversations that we have, the things that we say to each other, the, the stories we tell. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I hmm. can absolutely relate with you on that one. Um, in terms of building, can you talk a little bit more about the process of building a graphic novel? Because I think for a lot of people, and especially in the, right, we're in the superhero age right mm -hmm. now, so much comics are being consumed. Um, and I think people are really going back to that material. But I don't think a lot of folks really know the intensive process of what it's like to create a graphic mm -hmm. novel and kind of the steps that you go through. Can you give listeners kind of an idea of what your, at least your process is for yeah. creating a graphic novel? And and it's the process is a little bit different depending on the sort of area of the industry that you're in. Yeah. On big titles for like DC and Marvel, you have a team where um, oftentimes you will have a penciler who's doing sort of like the base drawings, is figuring out your pages and things, um, an inker who will be clean, uh, doing like black or colored ink work on top of that, then a colorist, then a letterer. Um, before all of that, there's a writer. Um, so there's a lot of people involved in indie comics, the way that I've tackled projects. Um, so for Pass Me By, I work with Ryan Danny Owen, mm -hmm. uh, another local visual artist and queer historian. And together we work on a script almost like we're writing a play or a film script. And we write in, we're writing our dialogue, we're writing in visual cues and character notes and action. And we work on that script uh, really closely. Um, we're, we're coming together weekly for writing sessions and going apart, writing things apart, reviewing together. And from this really collaborative script, I have a really strong idea of where things are going visually. Yeah. Um, because as the illustrator, I've been involved from the first part of writing. And so uh, taking that, then my process becomes seeing how that actually lays out as a book and discovering how long our books are going to be, which yeah. has always been longer than, than we suspected. Hey, ain't that um, just the way, honestly? Yeah, and I um, have like a really simple sort of thumbnailing process that I use to just figure out how are things going to lay out across a page? How is the emotional pacing of things going to work? How do I use panels to set up the sort of tension or relief that we're building in the script? Um, from there, I'm, I move um, from working sort of in big scenes down to pages at a time mm -hmm. where I'm uh, cleaning up pencils at this stage. I'm shooting a lot of reference photos. Um, I'm using uh, as many resources as I can, but honestly, the best, the easiest model to like figure out a lot of poses is myself. Yeah. Um, I happen to have a great wardrobe for Electric Vice. Uh, I had a lot electric of Electric Vice, the fits in Electric Vice. Um, so if everybody is paying attention <laughs> from earlier, um, Electric Vice is the second volume of um, Kat's um, series, Pass Me By, uh, and has just re recently been released. And yeah, it's um, the fits are, the fits are fits like I yeah. think that was something I was like really really admiring and um I got a lot of your personality mm -hmm. in terms of when I was going through everything and reading through stuff and connecting with the characters yeah it just was so because yeah um I don't know it was just so great seeing in terms of what you chose to represent everybody and I know that just being that you are the illustrator a lot of that is coming from your own personal preferences and what you appreciate and what you love and what you enjoy. So yeah, yeah, that was such an element I loved about this volume in particular. That was just so great. Yeah. So for anyone who hasn't read it, Electric Vice is a step into our uh, character's Ed's memories. And we're back in 1973. 
uh, exploring a period where Ed went on tour with a glam rock band. So it's very inspired by 70s glam rock. It's like such an exciting time where like gender norms were really being pushed. Mm-hmm. Like the New York Dolls were like basically in drag performing and doing photo shoots. David Bowie was appearing on covers in dresses. Mick Jagger wore a dress to a performance in Hyde Park. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. there was cool things happening at that time. And it like worked out in terms of timeline that like Ed would be young, early 20s around that period. And that was sort of the period I was going through and was like discovering a lot of my sense of fashion and and expression. And so that shows up in the book. But anyway, so uh, (laughs) yeah, there's there's a there's an extensive like reference shooting and I I do a lot of research. I'll dig into, um, you know, the sort of cities that I'm setting things in. Mm -hmm. There's a huge chunk of research at the at this stage. And then. From there, it becomes very aesthetic. Once I have these uh, these strong penciled pages down, uh, it's about creating rhythm and with the line, and like uh, it becomes a, a lot about like choices of weight in how I'm illustrating things. Are you working digitally? Yeah, yeah I do okay. all of this on Procreate on an iPad. Wild, isn't yeah. that isn't that app? Um, so Kat and I are both artists, um, or like, and we work in graphics and designs and things like that. Mm-hmm. So just in terms of watching that program expand to what it's been and what it's become wild yeah wild I, I mean i use like a pretty simplified tool palette for what i do yeah. and like a big thing that i discovered for book two um if you look at my illustrations there is a lot of closed shapes and the reason i do that is when i get to my color process i'm able to just like hot click an area and select it and then yeah. i can like select a bunch of areas and work gradients into things in book one, I hadn't figured that out yet, and I was literally, like, drawing in <laughs> all the tone in behind the shapes. Just going in. Just yeah, doing, doing it for everything. It's a trick I learned that saves me, like, an hour or a page. And I was like, when you're doing a 160-some page book, that's important. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, when you were going through this series, um, how do you feel like this impacted your identity, either as, like, an artist or as a queer individual? How do you feel that this series i don't know evolved you as a person or like did it do you feel like it changed you or do you feel like um as you were working with the characters and developing this story do you feel like um who you were becoming changed the story at all or did it change you how do you how did you feel about going through the process of developing everything absolutely to both um this story is like really special to me in a lot of different ways um you know it Writing Gone Fishing, I was, like, really tense, just, like, cutting out my heart and laying on the table in terms of a lot of what I was experiencing, um, particularly with mental health at that time. Yeah. Um, it came out of a period of, like, pro, very prolonged depression. And mm. interestingly enough, after the book uh, was published, uh, our first, like, self-publishing, uh, I had a summer where I ended up in the hospital three times in a row um with manic episodes this is when i discovered that i had bipolar disorder Mm. and um on top of all that like there was in that experience there was so much that i wanted to say through this series yeah um that i couldn't put into words for myself and like by writing out this story and and talking creating these like realities for these characters i was able to imagine those things for myself i was able to feel like i was finally like breathing i was like finally getting these things off of my chest I was like finally getting over like the shame that I felt Mm. and that's like really continued through this series um I don't want to give too much away about where we're going with book three but that becomes (laughs) that's the thing I'm like how much do we talk about obviously leave a good chunk for people to discover and experience but we got a tan so I don't want to give too much away but I will say that like in writing book three I was looking at some characters and I was like looking at my experience at like a high school age but in like a contemporary context and you know that was really where I started thinking about an idea of like transition and like if I was a teenager these days like how you know with the knowledge that I have with everything and then I would thought to myself like what is the difference between being 16 or 28 and like that like really crystallized a decision that had been sitting around for a while it had it's been a process I had been like asked on like a waiting list for like a year and a half. Yeah. Um, and it kind of, the writing process for this book and when I finally got a call back from that situation just like really solidified some th- directions that I wanted to go in my life um, and really helped me overcome the fear that I had attached with that. Yeah, so processing and really have processed those feelings, I guess, in terms mm-hmm. of like giving you an excuse, not an excuse, but just more like a very, very valid reason to 
work through those feelings. And also, too, I think um, interesting reflecting back on what you're telling me now and reading um, th um, the graphic novel, I think, it, or, or the two of them, is that you talk a lot about putting um, your personal experiences pretty heavily on the table in terms of when you were developing everything. Mm -hmm. But I think you do a really beautiful job of putting that into the characters mm -hmm. and developing that story and having it be something very personal and close to you, but having it not be um, a direct replica of your life, which I sometimes feel like can exclude people sometimes because yeah. it's so specific it feels, to you. It feels a little bit... It, they can be incredible too, like a bio, uh, like an autobiography can yeah. be really powerful. But um, yeah, I did find that like trans. What I try to do is like I'll some, I will experience something, <laughs> some triumph or some trauma, and like I try to find like the emotional core of what was going on there, yeah. and then translate into these other characters who might be decades removed from where I am in age, or you know in a de uh, entirely different time period. Um, from various different backgrounds and circumstances. And, and that that ability to translate that, I think, is really powerful mm -hmm. um, and something that really excites me about uh, sort of broadening the scope of identity that's represented in the series as well. Yeah, 100%. And that's something that I noticed um, with your character, Ed. So Ed, um, we start off with Ed in the first volume of um, Pass Me By, and he is essentially coming to terms with the fact that he has dementia. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of the novels um, are going, reflecting back on his life and um, his experiences as a young kind of I guess, out and coming queer man, yeah. um, you know, just experiencing things and um, reflecting back on those elements of his life and where they've led him to today. Uh, and Ed is considerably like he's fairly straight passing. And I think he mm -hmm. there's a lot of instances with him in the novels where I find he kind of has his masculine upbringing like coming in and kind mm -hmm. of like seeping in in ways that like you as a reader I, I guess wouldn't necessarily expect but also it's like it makes sense for just how he's been raised up until this point and the kind of the pressures that he's had to deal with um mm -hmm. yeah what were some important things for you when you were developing it as a character that you wanted to bring in and kind of like explore in his character and his journey was there anything in there that like you also yeah. related to that you wanted to kind oh, of absolutely yeah, absolutely. As we're talking about yeah. how this is a personal, no, like, personal talk, like you know, personal, all on the table experience of developing this. But yeah, who who was Ed for you in terms of what you put into him? I mean, like, um, Ed was like very much um, something that I like, a life that I felt beholden to, a life that I felt like um, destined to, and yeah. like, um, and scared of, and. Um, so that's like Ed in uh, book one being this like closeted, repressed and lonely man out, yeah. in, the, uh, out in the prairies who's just like uh, been playing along and like uh, living up to expectations. But uh, then getting into book two, um, you know, in book two, this like journey of a, um, going off on a glam rock tour and sort of discovering new possibilities for yourself just new ways of thinking about how you exist in the world mm -hmm. which can be very scary and that's a lot of what ed's going through in uh in electric vice but yeah it just totally rocks your I, foundation i feel like that's yeah. like a little bit of like a metaphor of like my experience like leaving small town life and going off to uh several different art schools um you know uh one of my big like breakthroughs uh for myself was when i went on a mobility exchange from acad uh, now AU Arts, oh, yes. and uh, <laughs> I went to the Rhode Island School of Design, and that was probably the first time that I ever had like significant manic depressive cycles. Okay, it was a really hard time for me, but there was also like these like punctuated now I recognize as manic moments where I I felt like a creative genius. I felt like like the way that ideas were firing through my head was wild. This is also a time where I met a dear friend of mine named Ray, uh, who went by they them pronouns. And I was like, you can do what now? Yeah. And you're allowed to break the rules. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait. <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah. Even just like starting to like look at the rules at that point. But yeah. there was something that just like clicked so immediately about like non-binary identity that um, that was like a real turning point for me. So like, I guess like being able to like step outside of this uh, sort of environment that you've grown to expect yourself to exist within yeah. and like realizing that there's other... Um, possibilities out there that there's other 
um, ways of looking at yourself and looking at the world. And yeah, that was something that kind of happens by happens by chance in my life in terms of getting this wild opportunity to go to RISD. And I like, kind of replicated that in Ed's life mm-hmm. in some capacity. And then that, that experience of, yeah, like Ed's, um, you know, there's a really important scene in, in there for myself where like Ed is like trying on these like glam rock garments. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in that context, it's very much about like, fitting into the band and like this, you know, feelings around Lou, like, uh, am I attracted to this person? Do I want to be this person? And that's a lot of stuff that I had brought out of my own experience. Um, yeah, the like, uh, things are, are not directly translated, but they, they all do kind of come from some sort of place, particularly from my, myself, a friend or from Ryan. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of Ryan in that story as well. Um, Ryan also grew up in a very small community. Um, I think Langdon, Langdon, I oh, believe. Oh, Langdon. And um, oh, wild. we're both. I'm from. Uh, I'm from Stetler, so I'm in like the Stetler? core. Stetler. Stetler. I used man. to go to Stetler all the time to play D and D with my friends. Oh um, my god, wild! Back in my early twenties. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was the in that town a lot. Time to be alive. Yeah. Down so in, in a Stetler. place like Stetler, Langdon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of experience uh, that we brought into that, and like um, helped. I think like. By, like, writing out these stories and, like, creating some sort of, you know, hope and resolution. And I'm able to write a little bit of a cliffhanger, but put some closure into there. And, you know, that allows me to, like, create that closure in my own story. Yeah. Um, which is a very satisfying thing to be able to do. But uh, it's also really hard. And it's it's very vulnerable. And it's, like, it's scary to put out a story like that. Oh, yeah. But with the way that it's been received, um, I couldn't be more happy. Yeah, and people are obviously connecting with, like, the mm-hmm. vulnerable, the vulnerability that you're putting on the table. Um, and that's really interesting what you're saying about um, the kind of just the Jenga blocks of pulling out um, identity and sexuality and orientation and what that means and kind of evaluating the rules, as you mm-hmm. put it, and how... I guess something that really always fascinates me is people who um, are struggling with these thoughts of, you know, um, their gender or their sexuality or their like, you know, sexual orientations and they suppress because I think, uh, you know, it's sometimes easier just to not have to deal with Mm -hmm. those feelings. But it's like I can understand because even when, um, yeah, I came out you take one block out and the whole thing crumbles, right? Mm-hmm. Like your your ideas of what everything means and roles that you are just like, yeah, this is how stuff is supposed to go. Mm-hmm. None of that stuff applies anymore. So I think that's, um, you've done a really beautiful job of capturing that kind of, uh, it's a gr- it's a beautiful experience, but at the same time, it is this one of the most alarming and scariest things you'll ever go through. Just in terms of like, you are starting from scratch, and there's uh, something amazing about that. But mm-hmm. it also is just like, oh my god, what do I do? <laughs> you know, like what are you, there's so many possibilities that I guess maybe that can yeah. be overwhelming. And um, that's like a thing that um, Brian and I have both talked about in other interviews with like how we're approaching the characters, and and honestly, how we live our own life. We're like. I feel like a lot of times there's, like, a pressure to, like, have all the answers Mm -hmm. and to, like, have a clean, rational explanation for who you are and what you are. And, you know, um, I don't think that things are that simple. I don't think that things are that clear cut. Never. You know, I think that things are always changing and, like, openness and um, appreciation for possibility is a great place to, to linger. And, yeah, I, I know in my own life I don't have clean answers for people about, um, where I've gone with transition and queer identity and mm-hmm. even life as an artist. You know, I don't have those clean <laughs> sure. answers, but we'll I'm never just, know. <laughs> it's, it's very funny. Um, uh, in another, we're sometimes asked like, uh, why do you make art? And it's like, I can't help it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> truly. Like... You're just like, it is just something that helps me survive, to be honest. Yeah. Like, right. It's just, it just comes down to it. Honestly, sometimes it's just like a, a soul, soul connection thing without being too artsy about it. Um, yeah, I don't know if you like want to like, uh, if something feels like a purpose, like lean into that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, and then, yeah, I another area too is that I wanted to congratulate you because you did receive um, 
a Canada Council for the Arts grant. Mm -hmm. And then that's going to support you through um, creating the third volume of Pass Me By. Um, So that is beyond exciting. Congratulations. Because that is like, you do not have to worry about financial security for the time being in terms of like, well, you know, (laughs) we all say that, but it's like, never never feels like it's enough in this economy, honestly. But just in terms of the, some percentage of the weight of, um, you know, having to balance things is taken off for you to be able to make this volume. So is there any thing that you can tell us about the volume, obviously, without spoiling major stuff for people who haven't um, read the series so far? Mm-hmm. But just in terms of you were talking about glam rock and that whole area, is there any other eras that you're wanting to explore for Pass Me yeah. By in the coming volumes? Yeah, I think I can I can talk about uh, the coming volumes as a whole as well as I can as about book three. Yeah. Um, book three is now written, and I'm gonna be and I'm gonna be working on that over the next two years. Oh, major chunk checked off. Yeah, uh, the fifth script is fantastic, and I'm very excited about it. And we're aiming for a release of fall 2024 with Renegade Arts Entertainment. Exciting. Uh, I haven't done this yet, but I could name drop it and say that it's called Pass Me By Lily. Uh. Um, yeah, and so the the big thing that we're doing with the series, like with each book, we want to have another layer um, revealed. And with book two... We wanted you to read that book and come back to book one in a new way. Um, And if you've read book one, book two has a different reading. We wanted them to have these separate but very connected storylines. Yeah. And um, continuing that forward, we're really looking to talk about intergenerational queer identity. And as the title predicts, there's there's ways that we start to explore that through the introduction of Ed's granddaughter, Lily. Yeah. And there's some really exciting um, opportunities that we have for our... Connection and disconnection, because it's also, we're still dealing with dementia. And we're also, like, talking about, like, Ed coming to terms uh, through book two. And that's sort of a reverse coming-of-age story in some ways. And we have that paired with um, a young girl who's just coming into her own and has also been sort of kicked into maturity a little bit younger than a lot of, uh, than some others might be. Um, Very queer experience. And... Yeah, the way that those stories start to talk together is really exciting. Um, And then, yeah, even beyond that in the series, I have a lot of uh, ambitions that had revealed themselves to me through the color palette. So with this story, um, it comes out of a process called Rhizograph, and it's limited color palette. I use pink and teal. And in book two, I discovered that if I layered this pink and teal that I had used very separately in the present together, I got these magentas and purples, and it was this really beautiful, um, pulpy, kind of vintage, high-saturation color palette. Yeah, 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 incredible. Um, And I still have room to maneuver, because if I push those colors even further, I start to get into, like, deep navies. And so, um, and that color palette has the interesting effect of looking more like modern comics. So I'm excited to... um, Quite possibly beyond book three, start injecting even more timelines into the story. So there's a there's a lot of conversations happening. Oh, and you have so much room doing. to play, hey, yeah. and just like so much room to explore it possibilities. Is a silly thing to do to set out writing a five book series. I thought it was going to take me a year a book when five, I said that. Five and, and five. Uh, That's exciting. And we're now heading towards year six, and I'm working on book three. So we're in for the long haul, though. <laughs> I like nothing in my life or my career has ever felt as satisfying as this story. I believe so, that. Like, yeah, it's it's actually very nice to have that. Like, as like a freelance artist and a muralist. Things can be pretty wild and all over the place and chaotic, and you never really know what's happening, um, you know, beyond a few months down the line. So it's really nice to have this project. And again, the Canada Council support to know yeah. that I have this project that that's going to be there for me and I'm going to be for, there for it. It's like there's a lot of love between myself and this series and my collaborative process with Ryan. Um yeah, it's very close to my heart, and I'm just glad that other people are uh, feeling that beat. Okay, yeah, that's absolutely, yeah, I'm. that will be deeply satisfying to have in a box set, I'm mm-hmm. sure, at some point. It will happen, Renegade, get on it. you got to get the box set. I would love to eventually, I like build my files a little bit big, so that if, uh, when the whole series is out, to produce like a like little bit upsized, uh, fully risograph book. I love that. I don't think that there's anything like that. Like people make like zines and some smaller books in risograph, um, but it's a process much closer to silkscreen than it is digital printing. So 
uh, really large production is very difficult. Like our second book was 180 some pages, including all of our um, publishing notes and things. And that could possibly be the largest Rise of Craft book there is. Yeah, yeah. Like that that project meant that our, our and it's we have like one um, lovely woman out in Ontario, yeah. Olivia at Pindot Press, who does it for us and had to hand manipulate like 6,000 pages. Oh my gosh. Like all of these things needed to be organized together and sent to bookbinders and covers cut and da, da, da. It's a huge process. Yeah, a huge um, labor of love for sure. Yeah. So that's why we do that as like a special edition. Yeah. That's like. F- fair enough. Very much. We like to say that that's like the painting to the print. Um, and yeah anyway that's the dream that's the that's the dream collector's edition so yeah let's, keep let's, your eyes out for that in that. like 2030 <laughs> I'll, 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 pre, I'll pre-order it get the get the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the kickstarter started we'll, we'll kickstarter get it. yeah it. yeah 100 okay well kat it was really great talking to you today thank you for coming and um chatting with us at calgary pride for CJ at cgsw um if folks wanted to reach out or just keep in contact with you or just watch what you're doing, because I know that we didn't have time to touch on it today, but you do have um, a ton of mural work that you do across the city of Calgary. And yeah. um, you do post about that on Instagram and locations and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, where can people find you if they wanted to? Yeah. If you'd like to see a survey of my work, I have a portfolio up at catsimmers.com. I have freelance work. All of my murals are up there. Um, and if you wanted to go on a personal tour, if you're located within Calgary, um, we, you could start at Shelf Life Books, where I have my viral Man- Vanitas, which was done for Bump 2019. And if you head west down 17th Ave, you would pass Metamor- uh, Metamorphosis for Ship and Anchor Pub, yep. Spectrum for Body by Chai, uh, and then Astro Dog for a Tubby Dog. Oh, um, good, good collection. Very yeah, eclectic. there's a nice Love little that. collection there. There's more scattered throughout the city. But, yep. um, if you check out my website, you'll be able to find some location information. And yeah, I'm pretty active on Instagram. Uh, I haven't got a handle on a lot of social media, but on Instagram, Reels. I'm Nightmare. at Nightmare. at cats underscore simmers. Okay, awesome. Okay, well, we'll make sure to plug that in there. Make sure that it's visual, so people that can they can they want to search for it, they can find it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, Cat, I wanted to thank you so much for coming and talking to us today and talking about vulnerabilities and you know the process of what it takes to do what you do. And yeah, it was so lovely getting to know you better today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. Absolutely.